Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you chose to join us once again. As you may know, we are studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the months of April, May, and June of 2013. This particular series of lessons is entitled Major Lessons from Minor Prophets. And this particular lesson is number 10 in that series for June 8 of 2013, entitled First Things First, Haggai. First things first. What do you suppose Haggai would say about first things first? Well, if you're interested in listening to our program and interested in doing something for your own Sabbath school, the handouts that we use, the guidelines we use to follow for our discussions are available on our website at theox, that's T-H-E-O-X dot O-R-G. Look at it sometime and see if it might be useful for you. Liven things up at church. <laughs> We'd like to encourage you to grab your Bible, but right now let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer together. Our kind and loving Father, we turn down once again to another of the small books of the minor prophets near the end of the Old Testament called Haggai. Haggai was an elderly gentleman who had a very rousing message and he did a good job with it. Don't we wish that it was so easy though that people could be as successful today as he was. Let's look at his book. Teach us what we need to know from these words from your prophet of so long ago is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Haggai is the only book in the Bible with two chapters. They're short chapters. It's a short book. Um, it's all about priorities. What are our priorities? Well, look at the chronology for this short book. Now, we have been talking about other books uh, other small books, and they were all, some of them were way back before the northern kingdom of Israel fell. <clears throat> uh, several of them now have been be just before the southern kingdom of Judah fell. Now we're taking a huge leap all the way down. We're, we're leaping down 170 years or something like that after the Babylonian captivity uh, <clears throat> at a time when it's time to try to rebuild to, to I'm sorry, I said 170, 70 years, about 70 years jump down to a time when it's time to rebuild and, and do some things. And a number of people, about 50,000 of them, have returned to, to Judah at, from Babylon. And um, they have been there about 16 years, something like 16 years, and it seems like nothing is happening. People have sort of given up on trying to do anything collectively. They're working on their own homes, etc. And that's where we pick up the book of Haggai. I was curious, the number of Jews that came from Babylon, about what percentage of the Jews did decide to leave Babylon when it was okay? That's a good question. Some people have estimated it was about 1%. About 1%. So 99% came to love Babylon? Well, either that or they just thought it was too much trouble to go back home. Okay. They so were we're satisfied. dealing... We're dealing with the people, the Jewish people, who did come back to their homeland. Yep. It's kind of hard to move. Yeah. No. Especially Anybody when you got to walk right. hundreds of miles. Mm -hmm. But it's your homeland. Yeah. Well, that's what these other people were thinking. My parents have been in their house for 51 years, 52 years. It's hard to move. Yes. Really yeah. hard. <laughs> yeah. Well, the first group of, of returnees from Babylon to Judah arrived somewhere in the in year 536, 535 BC. Remember that their years sort of span our, our New Year's date so that we have to have give, give two numbers. Hmm. About 15, 16 years later, on August 29 of 520 BC, how do we know it precisely like that? Look at, the, look at the, the passage, Haggai 1.1. During the second year that Darius was emperor of Persia, on the first day of the sixth month, the Lord spoke through the prophet Haggai. The, messages were the message was for the governor of Judah, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, and for the high priest Joshua, son of Jehozadak. But I mean, that far back, do you think we can know the dates that precisely? 
who was Haggai? Was he British a Jewish? Oh. What? It's in the British Museum, as he, I remember. Okay, and what did you learn in the British Museum? The, um, the clay tablets. Okay. Delineated. How does that down. help us? Well, it fits in with this here. Okay. There actually were times, and one of them was close to this time, in, <clears throat> in ancient history when people, someone would sit down and took a whole year and carefully chronicled exactly the astronomical events that happened every day that whole year. And we can go back, knowing the preciseness of, of the astronomical movements and so forth, solar eclipses and lunar eclipses and things like that, and we can go back and we say exactly, okay, this is exactly when it happened. That's how we, we did mean, it. It's, it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. Yeah, so when it says the first day of the sixth month, that's not June 1? No, no. This is, um, this is their system. Uh, they, their, their year started, based on that, their year started in, in April, May, well, March, April, and so the sixth day of, the first day of the sixth month would come down to August 29. Well, the day of the creation, when the, ball, when the stars, moons, and planets came into being, it was told that this was to mark off festivals and whatever. Mm -hmm. So it, that was their calendar, mm -hmm. and it's pretty accurate. You can go way back on that calendar, if your math is right. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, f I also find that he gives the best chronolo chronological marking points, once you really get to understand it, because before I didn't get it, but after I went back uh, with a s couple of people who pointed things out to me, and I got it. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, was Haggai a Jewish person in Babylon, yes. and was he of any um, heritage or? Well. That's a good question. Um, some people think that he was a Jew that had left Judah when he was very young, gone into Babylon in captivity, and now he's quite aged that he's come back. Um, Other people believe he was born in Babylon and came to Judah for the first time. There are a few people who believe that he was born in Judah and never went into Babylon in captivity. So uh, we don't know for sure. About two and a half weeks later, September 15, he had another message. Look at verse 15. On the 24th day of the sixth month of the second year that Darius, Darius was emperor, it says, start back with verse 13, Then Haggai gave the Lord's message to the people, I will be with you, that is my promise. The Lord inspired everyone to work on the temple. Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, Joshua, the high priest, and all the people had returned from, exi from, from the exile. They began working in the temple of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month, and so forth. That's a pretty incredible response, isn't it? Just like that, bang. You get the whole country stirred up to move. Do you get kind of a shadow of the 144,000 when you read that, the ones that are left over? Yeah. The ones that, but but then you can realize that God still take care of the people that were still in um, Babylon yeah. too. Well, he gave another message. I'm just going to go through the dates here real quick, and we'll look at the messages later. October 17, 520, a month later, and then a couple months after that, December 18, 520 BC, and finally clear down in March 12 of 515, they finished the job. So. Haggai, who worked with Zechariah, the two of them, working, of course, with the leaders, Zerubbabel and Joshua, stirred the people up, and they, they really got into the business, and they did a good job. So, um, Haggai's book, one of the shortest in the Bible, was written at a critical time in the life of Judah. The exiles had returned from their captivity in Babylon almost 20 years before yet they seem to have forgotten the reason for their return. They let God's temple sit in ruins while they devoted their energy to building their own houses. Of course, <clears throat> that kind of problem never <laughs> could affect us today, right? Well, that's, that's a little strange because these people left their houses in Babylon to go down to do something, and then they kind of forgot, and they started building up their houses. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah? Yeah. You, you get started and you have to have some place to live and then you have to have something to eat and then 
time goes by and it's 15 years later and you forgot what you came for. So you don't have first things first, huh? <laughs> or do you need that? <laughs> well, let's look at the words that, that he first preached, Haggai. The Lord Almighty said to Haggai, These people say that this is not the right time to rebuild the temple. The Lord then gave this message to the people through the prophet Haggai. My people, why should you be living in well-built houses while my temple lies in ruins? Don't you see what is happening to you? You have sown much corn, but have harvested very little. You have food to eat, but not enough to make you full. You have wine to drink, but not enough to get drunk on. <laughs> you have clothing, but not enough to keep you warm. And a worker cannot earn enough to live on. Can't you see why this has happened? Now go up into the hills, get timber, and rebuild the temple. Then I will be pleased and will be worshipped as I should be. And then follows that. You hoped for large harvests, but they turned out to be small. And when you brought the harvest home, I blew it away. Why did I do that? Because my temple lies in ruins while every one of you is busy working on his own house. That is why there is no rain and nothing can grow. Does God say, because I don't like what you're doing, I'm not going to send the rain? That's what it suggests see, in that verse. Now, why was the temple, I mean, why was it so important to God that they build the temple. Did, did they then, they were not sacrificing at that point? Did he wanted the process started again to remind them? When they came back from Babylonian captivity, they apparently club, cleaned some of the rubbish off of Mount Moriah and actually built a small altar, just in the outdoors in the open. And they were offering, presumably still at this time, they were offering sacrifices to God on that altar. But there was no temple, there was no whatever. And um, nothing really for the people to look to as sort of, you know, our place, our, you know. Well, why does it follow that a temple brings the rain, makes the crops fuller? That was my the, question. Yeah. Well, when you follow what God wants you to do, does your life prosper? That's, does, that does not always happen. Have you ever, have you ever tried that with tithing? <laughs> That's, it works. I mean, there are so many stories. Yeah. I think it's a, one of God's ways in this instance of they've just messed up tremendously and they're already got their priorities wrong, mm -hmm. yeah. paying him no mind at all at the time. Here, right here it says, I have <laughs> brought drought on the land. Yeah. There's, that's why there's no rain on its hills, cornfields, vineyards, and olive orchards. On every crop the ground produces, on people, on animals, on everything you grow. Looks like they were concerned about all the physical stuff, but when it came to the spiritual, mm -hmm. they were putting that behind the eight ball or yeah. whatever. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know. Obviously, Haggai must have been a pretty successful or pretty impressive preacher because everyone said, or maybe it was the drought, there was nothing to, nothing to harvest, I don't know. <laughs> they got to work. And what was the result? The temple. <laughs> the people dwelt in their homes and strove to attain temporal prosperity, Ellen White says, but their situation was deplorable. Work as they might, they did not prosper. The very elements of nature seemed to conspire against them. Because they had let the temple lie waste, the Lord sent upon their substance a wasting drought. God had bestowed upon them the fruits of field and garden, the corn and the wine and the oil as a token of his favor. But because they had used these bountiful gifts so selfishly, there's the basic problem, the blessings were removed. Prophets and Kings, page 573. Does God actually send drought? No, but he might allow the devil to. <laughs> What's the difference? You, you let the devil do the dirty work. That's you what you're, what you're that's saying that's right that's there. That's right. But I mean, <laughs> when, what, do you, what do we say when he removes his, when he lets the winds of strife go? I mean, he's doing that. It's his passive will. It was, so, a, it was a rural economy, and they had no economy. I mean, what other way is he going to catch their attention? That's what they were used to. Yeah. In Elijah's day, did he bring the drought? Yes, and then he made it rain at the end of it. <laughs> he had control. 
He did. Yeah. Well, does that sound like a God of love? We like to say God is love. That's a God of tough love. <laughs> this is a God of tough love. He's I trying see. to get their attention again. Yeah. That's right. Well, is it important for us to keep our priorities straight? I would remind you, and I, someone may have reminded them, that God had sort of warned them. Look at Leviticus 26, verse 16. I will punish you. I will bring disaster on you, incurable diseases and fevers that will make you blind and cause your life to waste away. You will sow your seed, but it will do you no good because your enemies will conquer you and eat what you have grown. And then dropping down to verse 20, all your hard work will do you no good because your land will not produce crops and the trees will not bear fruit. This is making me uncomfortable. Does, uh, I don't know. Does God do that? Yeah. Yeah. So this is the health and wealth gospel <laughs> in Deuteronomy that you mm -hmm. just read. Yes. If, if you're doing good, God will bless you and you'll know it because you're healthy and your crops will prosper, your animals will prosper. So if you're driving down the street with a nice new car, I know that you're doing everything God wants you to do, right? God's smiling on you. That's what Deuteronomy or Levitic, wh where was Leviticus, Leviticus suggests. Well, that's what makes me uncomfortable because there's so many good people that still end up yeah, what about Job when he started complaining about the wicked, getting every all the benefits mm -hmm. and uh, that everything seems to go their way and they die as if they're just satisfied, mm -hmm. you know? Well, last week we were talking about Zephaniah and we, the people in left Zephaniah's day, what's this now, almost a hundred years before Haggai, were saying, God's not going to do anything, either good or bad. Did he do something? Babylonian captivity, you better believe he did something. <laughs> in a day. Did it come yeah. in a day? Very short time. Yeah. Yeah. The thought of saying that people who have things are doing things according to God, what God wants them to do, is kind of problematic because the drug dealer has good things. The people who are doing atrocious things have good things as well. Mm -hmm. So it cannot be just that. Okay. Well, in Haggai's day, the question was about building God's temple in Jerusalem. After returning from Babylon, they had built a small altar, presumably on the bare rock of Mount Moriah, to give offerings to God. But years had gone by, and no further progress was made, partially because of the opposition of their neighbors. I mean, what do you do if your neighbors are trying to, you try to put something up and they burn it down, for example? Oh, now we're hearing another part of the story. So they were having a hard time building yeah. the temple and it was easy to give up. But then suddenly Haggai and Zechariah appeared and began speaking on God's behalf. In a very short period of time, about three and a half months, Haggai gave four messages to the people and one message personally to Zerubbabel. The work of the temple began and people did what they could and in a period of about four years, the temple was completed. I mean, do you think these people who had come back from Babylon were a bunch of rich guys? No. They had the clothes on their back, didn't they? Probably not. And yet they managed to find... Did, didn't they have some support from, uh, from the government? Well, so. that came along more later. Mm -hmm. Not so much at this point. They got some support, but... Uh, so. Um, would you say that uh, Haggai and Zechariah proved to be successful prophets? Absolutely. Can you think of any other really successful prophets? Jonah. Jonah. Whoa, 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. Pretty impressive, right? Can you think of any others? Moses. Yeah, he took 40 years, but he was pretty successful. I'm thinking about Nehemiah. Do you remember what Nehemiah did? He got the message from the king. He said, I mean, he got the message from his relatives that things were in bad shape back in Jerusalem. He was working for the king of Persia. And the king said, yes, I give you permission to go. Here's some money. Go. And he, with a small group, he zooped over there to Jerusalem. He went out in the middle of the night. 
He says, I'm going to assess the situation. I'm going to find out what's going on with his donkey. And it was so rough in some spots, he couldn't even ride his donkey. He toured around the city and says, I know exactly what needs to be done. He called all the children of Israel, well, probably the inhabitants of Jerusalem in the area right around there. He said, we're going to, we're going to finish this, this wall. We're going to keep, our safe from, or keep ourselves safe from enemy. Fifty-two days later, it was finished. Is that where they were building the wall with one hand and they had the sword in the other to mm -hmm. defend themselves against? Exactly. Mm -hmm. So here's four people that we know of from prophets from, New, from Old Testament times that were, you know, they just got right in there and bang, things happened. Well, what do you suppose God did differently? We, we read the verse, maybe we should just look at it again. Then Zerubbabel and Joshua and all the people who had returned from exile in Babylon did what the Lord their God told them to do. They were afraid and obeyed the cam, afraid and obeyed the prophet Haggai, the Lord's messenger. Then Haggai gave the Lord's message to the people, I will be with you, that is my promise. The Lord inspired everyone to work on the temple. Zerubbabel, the governor of Judea, the governor of Judah, Joshua, the high priest, and all the people who had returned from exile. They began working on the temple of the Lord Almighty, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month, the second year that Darius was emperor. I mean, two and a half weeks, and everybody's out there in a, some kind of a work bee. Isn't it wonderful when God says, I will be with you? Yeah. What do you suppose that meant? What, what, what did it mean, I am with you? Haggai yeah, must have had, uh, I don't want to say charisma, but something to... Make the people believe God will be with you. Yeah. When God is with you, don't you get ideas that are successful? Your uh, actions meet with success? Obviously, they didn't have to get approval by the county board of supervisors. Or <laughs> <like that. laughs> but if God is with you, they will approve. Yeah. The yeah. focus got changed. What amazes me is in those days there had to have been some good tradesmen and yeah. and what have you or subcontracted out to something. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but that's a lot of work. Yeah. In Haggai one twelve, there's the phrase, they were afraid and obeyed. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. Is that what we, we, we have want a song, people to be afraid? Is that the same? Uh, I don't think so. You don't think so? They were afraid and obeyed. You think what that is would be the same as fear? Yeah. With respect to... Uh, fear uh, sometimes is respect. But yeah. Could you, afraid could does, has totally different connotation to me. Yeah. I think so. Well, were they afraid because of what was happening to their crops? Did they recognize that God has the ability to do something? That he has the ability to bless them might be afraid that um, if they don't change their course, it's going to continue like it has been. Things weren't going so well, and Haggai provided a promise. Maybe they were afraid they were going to have to go back to Babylon. Well, did they have any um, precedent for what God was saying to them? Do you know? Remember? Look at Genesis 26, verse 3. God speaking to Abraham now. Live here, and I will be with you and bless you. I'm going to give all this charity to you and your descendants. I'm sorry, this is Isaac. I will keep the promise I made to your father, Abraham. So this kind of I will be with you promises have been made earlier. And look at Moses, Exodus 3.12. God answered, I will be with you, and when you bring the people out of Egypt, and so forth. And not only that, coming down some years later, Numbers 14.9. Do not rebel against the Lord, and don't be afraid of the people who live there, talking about Canaan. We will conquer them easily. The Lord is with us and has defeated the gods who protected them, so don't be afraid. For the 144,000, does God say he'll be with them? Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus even said he would be with the, the, them also. Mm -hmm. So, Do we live our lives as if we really believe God is with us? How do we know if God is with us? Don't we believe he's omnipresent? That's not very comforting, maybe. We you know, it's almost like it's a difference between randomness. You go out there, you go out in the battle or whatever, and you don't know if a bullet's going to hit you or whatever. 
there's that kind of thinking versus going out there and somebody says that God will be with you. I believe that. And then you go out there with that kind of idea. Send the choir ahead of you. And uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a difference there. Yeah, there is. Well, in the last, what, 20 or 30 years now since the Hubble telescope has been up there, we have looked around into far corners of our universe. And there are so many galaxies and worlds and things out there. It's unbelievable. And yet, we're told that God is going to come down. He sent his son down here, and we know what he did. And God's going to come down and make this little blue marble his headquarters, apparently for the rest of eternity. Why does he care about this little blue marble? Uh, this little blue marble and what happened here yeah. and what he did served and made the universe secure. Mm -hmm. Nothing in history before or in the future could ever match what happened that time. Mm -hmm. we're, we're the little marble that is the theater of the universe where Satan is playing out his hand. Yeah. You know, you're talking about a little marble, even that's kind of big. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. You can't even you need that's a true. microscope. <laughs> well, what happened? Let's move on. Chapter 2, halfway through the book already. Of the 21st day of the seventh month of that same year, the Lord spoke again through the prophet Haggai. He told Haggai to speak to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, to Joshua the high priest and to the people, and to say to them, is there anyone among you who can still remember how splendid the temple used to be? Now, which temple was that? Solomon. Solomon's temple. How does it look to you now? It must seem like nothing at all. But now, don't be discouraged, any of you. Do the work, for I am with you. When you came out of Egypt, I promised that I would be always with you. I am still with you, so do not be afraid. They were afraid. God says, do not be afraid. Is this what Haggai was telling uh, the people? Mm -hmm. So this was a positive um, yeah. message. Now they're, start, they're working. Yeah. Look at uh, Ezra's recounting of what happened. He, Ezra is now 75 or 80 years later. He's talking back about what happened in the days of Haggai and Zechariah. Many of the older priests, Levites, and heads of clans had seen the first temple. And as they watched the foundation of this temple being laid, they cried and wailed. But the others who were there shouted for joy. No one could distinguish between the joyful shouts and the crying because the noise it made was so loud that it could be heard far and wide. So I guess that's the way you deal with the crying, right? So why were the old people crying? Well, I mean, Solomon's temple was one of the seven wonders of the world, and now they're putting up a little shanty, more or less. <laughs> But people were very ha uh, happy that it, there was at least a shanty, even if it wasn't as beautiful as it was. Yeah. And wasn't there a prophecy that this, pro this temple would be even more glorious than well, the Well, that's interesting. God had great plans for this new temple. At the dedication of the tent tabernacle in the wilderness, back in Moses' day, God's presence had descended to fill it so that not even Moses could go inside. Take a look at that. That would be Exodus 40, the last couple of verses, well, not the very last couple of verses, in the last paragraph of the book of Exodus. Then the cloud covered the tent, and the dazzling light of the Lord's presence filled it. Because of this, Moses could not go into the tent. Now, this is the Moses who had spent two 40-day periods on the mountain in private conversation with God, and yet now his presence fills this tent, and Moses can't go in. Okay, that's, that's the tent back in the tabernacle. Well, but this temple, um, a similar occurrence happened at the dedication of Solomon's temple. Take a look at that. First Kings, First Kings 8, verses 10 and 11. As the priests were leaving the temple, it was suddenly filled with a cloud shining with the dazzling light of the Lord's presence, and they could not go back in it to perform their duties. Was that ever described as fire any place? 
dazzling light? Could yeah. it well, be the, the dazzling glory yeah, in, in this yeah. environment? Out in the wilderness, it was a pillar of fire by night yeah. and a pillar of cloud by day, and it entered the, the temple here, I, yeah. I suppose. Um, <laughs> well, so now we have the biggest, the single, I think, the single biggest, most important point in the book of Haggai, and that's verses 6 to 9. Chapter 2, verses 6 to 9. Before long I will shake heaven and earth, land and sea. I will overthrow all the nations and their treasures we brought here, and the temple will be filled with wealth. All the silver and gold of the world is mine. The new temple will be more splendid. Do, do any of you have a look at verse 8 in your different translations? Do any of you have a different words for it than that? The new temple will be more splendid than the old one. And there I will give my people prosperity and peace. The Lord Almighty has spoken. Haggai 2.8. Or 9. Yeah. I'm sorry, 9. <laughs> Anyone have different words? The latter splendor of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. The latter splendor. In this place I will give prosperity, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. Okay, the glory. In what way? I mean, here's this little tiny building. Some of them had seen Solomon's absolutely magnificent temple. What do you suppose they thought? What do you suppose they had in mind when Haggai says, hey, this temple is going to be bigger, brighter, more glorious than that one? They said, Probably give saying, us a you, break. You've got to be kidding. you got to be kidding. <laughs> Maybe we're going to be remodeling it. <laughs> a major <laughs> remodel. It, a major remodel is coming. That's true. When Herod got money from the Roman government and they there was a they they worked on it for 60 plus years. Oh, they did remodel. Oh, yeah. Kind of like a WPA program. What? Kind of like a WPA program. Yeah, like something like that. <laughs> did when this temple was uh, ready for business and open, did the presence of the Lord fill it like uh, No. It didn't. It didn't. Well, listen to these words from Ellen White. Mm -hmm. But the second temple had not equaled the first in magnificence. Now this is talking about later in the days of Jesus. Nor was it hallowed by those visible tokens of the divine presence which pertain to the first temple. In other words, the Ark of the Covenant never was in this temple. There was no, the Ten Commandments were never in this, in this temple. There was, uh, uh, you know, no manifestation of supernatural power to mark its dedication. That was your question. No cloud of glory was seen to fill the newly erected sanctuary. No fire from heaven descended to consume the sacrifice upon its altar. Remember, they had, had, they had seen fire come down from heaven to actually consume the sacrifices. The Shekinah no longer abode between the cherubim and the most holy place. The ark, the mercy seat, and the tables of the testimony were not to be found therein. No voice sounded from heaven to make known to the inquiring priest the will of Jehovah. For centuries, the Jews had vainly endeavored to show wherein the promise of God given by Haggai had been fulfilled. Yet pride and unbelief blinded their minds to the true meaning of the prophet's words. The second temple was not honored with the cloud of Jehovah's glory, but with the living presence of one in whom dwelt the fullness of God, Godhead bodily, who was God himself manifested in the flesh. The desire of all nations had indeed come to his temple when the man of Nazareth taught and healed in the sacred courts. In the presence of Christ and in this alone, or this only, did the second temple exceed the first in glory. But Israel had put from her the proffered gift of heaven. <clears throat> With the humble teacher who had that day passed out from its golden gate, the glory had forever departed from the temple. Already were the Savior's words fulfilled your house is left unto you desolate. Great Controversy, page 24, paragraph 1 and 2. So instead of the Shekinah glory coming into the temple, Jesus walked in mm -hmm. as the Shekinah glory in a person. Now what did Jesus do at the temple in Jerusalem, just so we can sort of fill out the picture in our minds? Did he clean it out? He taught. Oh, he taught? Okay, remember that the outside perimeter, the, out, the big outer court in the temple in, in those days was supposed to be for Gentiles to come and learn how to worship the true God. 
they had turned it into what? Marketplace. A marketplace. Market. So what did Jesus do when he came there into the temple? Teaching. Cleaned out Remember, the market. Yeah, he cleaned out that. Yeah. But what would happen is this. And it's very interesting. They had, they had almost wanted dead or alive signs out for Jesus in the latter part of his ministry. They were doing everything possible. They could catch him. But he would slip into the temple early in the morning. He would find a place. Usually there, was, there are a lot of porches and so forth on the sides. He would find one of those places and he would start teaching and the crowds would just flock to him. And then they, they were afraid to do any, They were afraid to take any action against him because they knew the people would be very upset if they tried to. So Jesus did this again and again and again and again. And of course they would come and try to raise, ask questions and stir up problems, but they never were successful. So think about that. What? Here's Jesus. He's dusty. He's travel-worn. He's wearing the common ordinary clothes of the people. He comes in. He probably sits down on a block of marble or something, and he starts teaching, and God says, that is more glorious than my presence coming down like lightning in a cloud of fire. How can that be? Is that some way that God had always wanted to be softly coming and talking to his people and he always had to do it before with thunder, lightning, but he really preferred that way? Mm -hmm. well, Isn't that what we were supposed to learn from Elijah at the mouth of the cave after the fire, wind, and earthquake? Yeah, remember what happened to Elijah there voice? after running away from Jezebel after that incredible experience on the top of Mount Sinai, uh, Mount Carmel, I'm sorry. He comes down to Mount Sinai and he's hiding in a cave on the side of Mount Sinai. I wish I could find that cave. I'm going to Mount Sinai in a few weeks. Anyway. Yeah, but don't you think there's a parallel here between the earth that we just talked about mm -hmm. being so small yeah. and God coming down to have it for his headquarters? Yes. And then you've got this small temple here mm -hmm. that all the power of the universe comes to this small temple yeah. in, a, in a way that surprises people. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. The story of Elijah at the mouth of the cave is First Kings 19. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And here he is, and God calls him out to the mouth of the cave, and he sends a, a wind so powerful that it's, it's, it's knocking rocks off the side of the mountain. But not, God's not in the wind. And he sends an earthquake, and probably more rocks come tumbling down, and God's not in the earthquake. And then he sends a fire, and you can just see Elijah say, Yes! You know, we know, we know what happens when the fire comes down like that. I mean, he knew about Mount Carmel. Remember, the fire came down and burned up not only the sacrifice and the wood, but the, the stones and left a black hole in the ground. Yeah. So Mount where Carmel was, is now a very high rent district. Where was God after he wasn't in the f wind, God, the earthquake? Then God and showed up in a still, small voice. And it's, it's, it's such a quiet thing that some people have translated the sound of a small silence or the sound of a small whisper or something like that. In good news, the soft whisper of a voice. Mm -hmm. So a voice of reason, logic, going over the facts rather than power and... Yeah. So God says, if I can have a chance to come and sit down and talk to you, and people are willing to stand there the whole day, in some cases, listen to what I have to say. That's my idea what's really good, as opposed to beautiful temples, lots of gold, ivory, gems, etc., etc., all that stuff, or ritual, or whatever. God's idea is, let's sit down, let's talk as friends. That's quite a message. Now today, would God say, I don't care um, uh, like about your riches or whatever, but let's read the Bible today? Yep. Anyone who has spent any amount of time studying the Old Testament carefully realizes how often and how completely the children of Israel departed from God's plan for them. It has now been almost 170 years 
since the great disappointment of 1844. How are we doing? We're still here. <laughs> We're still here. That's, that's, the, that's the final word. And Haggai's day, inspired by the encouragement of Haggai and Zechariah, the people came together and despite their financial difficulties, remember they, they weren't harvesting crops, they weren't not, and I wonder, how, how did they manage to do this? Uh, do we need Haggai's and Zechariah's in our day? Could we restate that sentence? In today's day, inspired by the encouragement of blank and blank, the people came together and despite their financial difficulties, managed to finish the three angels' message. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> Yeah. Who's so our we need inspirers? Some, we need yeah. some Haggai's and some Zechariah's. Or some people put that into building churches. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And building the, projects. It's appropriate to do that sometimes. How often do we allow the urgencies in our day to day lives to eclipse the more important matters of eternity? Is it more important to put, and this is a tough question, think about it carefully. Is it more important to put food in our mouths, roofs over our heads, and clothes on our backs than it is to prepare for the second coming of Christ? You know, but parents have to work, and they have mm -hmm. to put roofs over heads. They have to raise their kids, and they haven't got a moment to spare that they don't have to sleep. And, and, and so don't, don't you think the devil thinks that's just great? Yeah. We could probably live a little less opulently than we do. Well, and God says, you know, the gold and the silver are mine, the cattle and a thousand hills are mine. Could God provide for us if we said, well, let's make God's work his business first? Do you think he would provide for us? Yeah. For well, there's the been kingdom some pretty God. good evidence of that. Yeah. Well, Haggai talks about a drought that was sent in his day. What would be the equivalent of a drought today? We, we're not subsistence farmers. Depression, recession. Or rainfall, to put it in a practical sense. Mm -hmm. They've been worried about that here for a while. We're having a drought of dollar bills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, people are losing houses. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mean yeah. there are some places where it is really tough. Very much so. Well, here's the really tough question in terms of Haggai. Do we believe that God knew the future? Absolutely. He, that he still knows the future. He knew perfectly well what was going to happen in Jesus' day, back in Haggai's day and Zechariah's day. So why does he send Haggai and Zechariah, Zerubbabel, Joshua the high priest, and later Ezra and Nehemiah, to urge the people to proceed with building, first of all, the temple, and then the rebuilding of the walls of the city and all that kind of stuff, if he knows that, what's the conclusion? They're going to they're reject Christ. They're going to kill him. Finally, what, 40 years after that, the whole thing is going to be completely destroyed again, and the people are going to be taken off ultimately into... And he's going to make it obvious it's their problem, not his. And make, it problem, it's, make it obvious it's their problem. Well, and how many people did he manage to get through to during that time? So yeah. maybe... And in that period when Jesus was here, he demonstrated what God is like more clearly than the prophets okay. of old have, and we have that. I would like to read to you Galatians 4, verse 4, and I'd like to read it in several different versions. Uh, first of all, my Good News Bible, but when the right time finally came, God sent his own son. He came as the son of a human mother and lived under the Jewish law okay, at the right time. Uh, the King James Version says, when the fullness of time had come. The Jewish New Testament says, when the appointed time arrived. Today's living, I mean the living Bible, the living translation, or when the right time came, or the RSV, the NIV, when the time had fully come, or the contemporary English Version, when the time was right, or the message, when the time arrived that was set by God the Father. What happened? Jesus came. Why did he pick that time? Well, 
that was the only time that he had a group of people who were Sabbath keepers and tithe payers and health reformers, and they had it all put together. I see. So he came and they all just gathered around him and rejoiced and everything was great, right? Didn't work that way. Didn't work that way? Well, what was God looking for? You mean when he sent Jesus? Why did he pick the time he did? I mean, some people have suggested God is going to come back when things get really bad, when wickedness really, really just gets so bad. Well, if he was planning to finish things up when wickedness is really bad, why not before the flood? There was more to be shown. More to be shown, I see. So now, 2,000 years since, since the days of Jesus, there's more to be shown? Mm -hmm. Are you saying why did he pick that exact time for Jesus to come to the earth? Yeah. That's a puzzlement. Why did he? Well, I asked I ask the, ask the question first. <laughs> but you, you have the answer. <laughs> well, the Jews and Jesus, let, let's think about some things we know for sure. The Jews in Jesus' day had given up fertility cult worship. They had given up gross idolatry. They had given up intermarriage with the heathen. You can read all that back there in the, in the books in the Old Testament. Uh, they had successfully rebuilt the temple, and now under Herod's, in, in the Roman government's assistance, they had a huge temple, a magnificent thing. Even before it happened, God understood all that was going to occur. He knew that they would leave all their gross external immorality and become the most strict, law-abiding, health-reforming, Sabbath-keeping, tithe-paying, you know, these words we use, group that ever lived on planet Earth. They had to ritually clean themselves after returning to the market in case they should somehow come in contact with the Gentile and ritually contaminate themselves. You know, uh, some of you may say, what? Look at Mark 7. Mark 7, chapter, uh, first five verses. Some Pharisees and teachers of the law who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They noticed that some of his disciples were, were eating their food with hands that were ritually unclean. <coughs> That is, they had not washed them in the way the Pharisees said people should. For the Pharisees, as well as the rest of the Jews, follow the teaching they received from their ancestors. They do not eat unless they wash their hands in the proper way. Uh, some translations have in a peculiar way. No one, there's one, verse at, one word at the end of that sentence. Nobody has a clue what it means. So, nor do they eat anything that comes from the market unless they wash it first and they follow many other rules which they have received, such as the proper way to wash cups, pots, copper bowls, and beds. So the Pharisees and the teachers of the law asked Jesus, why is it that your disciples do not follow the teaching handed down by our ancestors, but instead eat with ritually unclean hands? Jesus, yeah? He had demonstrated in Israel what happens when you follow the other gods. Mm -hmm. This was the first time he had the opportunity to show what happened when you worship God for the wrong reason. Yeah. This had been handed down by their ancestors. It had not been handed down by God. Right. So these were man-made rules that came from some people back in the Jewish history, but it was not God's rules. Yeah. So it was man versus God. Well, the interesting thing is, if you go back into Old Testament history, 2 Kings 22 and 23, Nehemiah 8, there were two different times that we know for sure when someone found a copy of the Bible, some, at least a part of the Bible, read it out loud to the people, and there was a huge reformation because somebody just read the Bible to them. Mm -hmm. Now we come to the days of Jesus, and what did the Pharisees do? They memorized the Bible. They memorized, they studied it every day, they memorized it. And what good did it do them? None. Not much. This might suggest that those who are very religious and saintly are actually at times farther from God than the more flagrant sinners. Is God trying to show us that the ditch is just deep on each side of the road? This is hard for modern Christians to accept because we immediately recognize it. 
we are well, much more like the Pharisees than we are like the idolatrous and immoral Jews in the Old Testament. It's always much easier to point the finger at those who are quite different from what we are than it is to recognize that there might be some terrible sinners that look just like us. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a horrifying thought. The question that must be faced in such situations is, are we any better? We're not even like, we do not even like to think about it. They had a system in which they worshiped God for selfish reasons. Yes. And if, I think they demonstrated what that modus operandi results in. Mm -hmm. And when he came, when Jesus came, and demonstrated his selfless, unselfish way of living and interacting with, with people. They wanted no part of it. But, I mean, I mean, isn't it obvious that we're a lot better than those sinners in the Old Testament? No. No? We have more light, we have more, we have more information, we have the life of Jesus, we have a whole history but that doesn't change the experience. Yeah. Well, God is doing his best to warn us of all the possible hazards. I mean, think about the three angels' messages again. Mm -hmm. He would like to keep us from the gross sinfulness of the ancient peoples, but he would also like to prevent us from being caught up in the much subtler and more dangerous sins of pride, self-righteousness, selfishness, spiritual superiority that characterize the Jews of the New Testament. What were God's objectives in rebuilding the temple if he knew it was coming? Why, why go through this whole exercise? If an angel had gone by and maybe stopped in front of God and said, God, uh, I don't quite understand this. What, what, what's the goal of rebuilding this temple? What do you think God would have said? Well, first... Do we understand what the goal is as far as what success is? Well, that's part of the question. Obviously, God wants to bring this whole sin experiment to an end. I, I think we can be pretty sure of that. But you don't want to do it too quickly or else some lessons may not be <laughs> understood. Okay. <laughs> so what would be success for God? When he has a people who are so settled into the truth that they cannot be moved mm -hmm. in any way, that would be success. God is trying, listen to this very carefully, God is waiting for the truth about sin to be so fully documented and, and, and demonstrated that the record which will be preserved in heaven would prevent anybody ever in the future who might be tempted to go back to sin to say, no, I'm not going that way again. This is, this, our little world here has, has become the theater of the universe, 1 Corinthians 4 9. And God is going to make absolutely sure that there's nothing about the evil of sin that hasn't been demonstrated uh, on this one time. This is, this is a one time experiment. It's not going to happen again. So God waits for sin to go fully to seed. It's the only way he can secure the universe against apostasy and rebellion for all time to come. It was necessary for him to go through all that, um, all that he's gone through to accomplish this. It is hard to imagine God doing many of the things that he do has done unless there was a very good reason for doing so. We have no way of knowing how early the angels began to understand all of this, but some of it was not clear until Calvary. In fact, she goes on to say in that chapter it is finished, there were some things they still don't understand. Now, God on this earth is showing how sin is, and sin does kill. And he's also showing his character. So mm -hmm. there's two, two learning experiences going on. We're beginning to understand God, and we're beginning to understand sin. Well, God plans to reestablish re a new heaven and a new earth. And in this new heaven and new earth, there's not going to be any FBI, no CIA, no reg police on every corner, no KGB, no any such group. 
And so he can't take to heaven anyone who's not safe to have there. He can only take to heaven people who choose to do right because it is right. That's the only way he can, he can I mean, the only people it's safe for him to take there. He can't take anybody that um, he needs to put in jail? No. <laughs> now, theoretically, hypothetically, God could save everybody. How would he do that? He would have to create a gargantuan, you know, solitary confinement prison with just individual cells. Every one of us would have to go in our own little cell. An angel would come around and poke a little food in every day, but we wouldn't be able to get out of those cells for fear we might hurt each other. Now, there won't be sin in heaven. So mm -hmm. if we enjoy sin, we won't feel comfortable in heaven? That would be hell for That's you. right. Yeah. yeah. Well, is God saying to Haggai here, if you don't worship me first, I can't bless you? Is God being selfish when he says that? What's well, the first commandment? The description of reality. Who stands to gain the most if we worship the true God? We do. We do. We do. So when God asks us to do that, is he being selfish? Not at all. He's saying, this is the best thing. Do what's very best for you. <clears throat> He's explaining like the law of gravity. This is how it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, in the book of Isaiah particularly, he, he spells out what a difference there is between the magnificent, super intelligent God that we worship and those chunks of metal and wood and stone and gems and so forth that the people used to make in ancient times. Just imagine what a contrast there is. So when we worship something or something, we tend to become like that. So what does God ask us to do? He says, for your best good, worship me. Learn to know me. Get to know me. Learn what kind of a person I am. It will have a transforming effect on you personally. Not just in the future life, of course that'll happen too, but even in this life, studying God, learning more about Him <coughs> will change us to become more like Him. And that's exactly what we need to do. Hope you've enjoyed our discussion of the Little Book of Haggai. See you next week.